What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be brewing up an Irish red ale. It's that time of year again. It's time for us to brew either an Irish stout, an Irish red ale, or both. For me, at least, this is one of my favorite times of the year because I personally love both of these beers and it's really just a lot of fun to make seasonal beers. Last year I made an Irish stout and the year before that I made an Irish red ale and the year before that I made an Irish stout. So we're just going to continue that alternating pattern, I think, for uh, from here on out. But the Irish Red Ale is a good one because it's actually a ridiculously easy beer to make, uh, especially if you're a newer brewer. The whole, the hardest thing about this beer in general is just getting that correct red character. Um, you really can do whatever you want with the red character. It can be copper, it can be brown, or it can be a striking scarlet red, which is what I really like in my Irish Reds. The whole point of this beer is to brew a very easy drinking pint that is uh, really uh, pretty much very similar to an English bitter except without uh, as much malt complexity in it and with that striking red color. Traditionally an Irish red ale actually gets its red color not from like crystal malts and stuff like that like the English bitter does but actually from a very very small amount of roasted barley addition. Uh, so I'm going to be adding about one or two ounces of roasted barley into this five gallon batch. That should give me a very striking red color once it clarifies. The thing is, it has to be a clear beer for that red color to really shine. Uh, otherwise, it comes out as kind of like a muddled brown. The Irish red we're making today is a pretty classic example of this style, using the roasted malts to get that color. Uh, but also considering that Irish brewers way back in the day really didn't have the access to the ingredients that the English brewers did. Caramel malts, for example, would have been very difficult for them to find, so there would have been a lower amount of caramel malts in these recipes. They would also be adding in some fermentable adjuncts. They're actually adding in a little bit of corn in this recipe, kind of uh, in a nod to that. I'm also trying out a new base malt for the first time in this recipe, so it should be very interesting to see what that does. Before we jump into the recipe, I do want to give a shout out to a couple organizations for helping support the channel and making the video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer, who supplied the ingredients for this batch of beer, and they are a great place to go check out for your ingredients, for your equipment, any sort of thing you might need for home brewing. Odds are Northern Brewer carries it at a good price, so go check them out. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, they manufacture the system that I've been brewing on for the last two years. It is a very, very good system, and I don't see myself changing out of it anytime soon. They have 120 and 240 volt options, 10 and 20 gallon options as well for your electric brew house. Do check them out. Check out their YouTube channel as well. It's a highly entertaining one. So now for our recipe. Uh, so the base malt that I'm starting out with, that I haven't used before, is Ashburn Mild Malt. Um, this is made by Brees. It is a mild malt, uh, which means that it's the base malt for the particular mild style. Despite it being the first time that I've used this malt on this channel before, I've actually brewed with it before. Um, so I used it at my local craft brewery. I was helping my friend Jason brew up a three barrel batch of a red ale and uh, the Ashburn mild malt was actually the base and it turned out really nice. And I thought, why don't we try that in the Irish red? So we are. Um, adding to that, the one pound of flaked corn that I mentioned. Uh, so that's gonna dry the beer out a little bit, add some more fermentables. Uh, I'm hoping that one pound isn't so much that it adds a corn flavor to the beer. We don't want this to be like the cream ale that had two pounds of corn in it and had that corn puff flavor. But we want something in there to kind of increase the, the alcohol content a little bit without increasing the body, but not necessarily sugar. Um, and then we're going to add only three quarters of a pound of English medium crystal malt. This is from Simpsons, um, and this is about a 90 lava bond crystal malt. Uh, I do, as I always say with these, I'm not a huge fan of always putting crystal malt in beer. It adds a lot of sweetness, but in certain styles it's appropriate, specifically the English, Irish, and Scottish styles of beer. And uh, to be honest, English crystal malts really are in a class of their own way above the traditional 20, 40, 60, 80 lava bond crystal malts that we know from standard maltsters. And then they'll round everything out and to really dial in that color, I'm gonna be adding in two ounces of roasted barley. But what I'm gonna do is instead of crushing them with the rest of the mash, uh, I'm actually gonna crush them and save them uh, and in like a small jar or something on the side. And then as the mash is uh, recirculating and after I get my pH figured out, we're gonna look at the color of the mash and dial it in from there by slowly adding in a little bit at a time of this roasted barley until we get exactly the color that I want. That way we don't overshoot the color by accident and turn this into a brown ale. 
For our hops in this one, I'm gonna be using only East Kent Goldings. Um, you could also use Fuggles perhaps uh, if you wanted to, or perhaps a stronger bittering hop, but this is not necessarily a hoppy beer by any means, but there is a little room for some hop flavor in there. And my favorite English hop is far and away East Kent Goldings. So we're gonna be adding that one in at 60 minutes for bittering and then 30 minutes for flavor. The whole thing is only gonna have about 20 to 25 IBUs. This will probably be the most minerally beer I've brewed in a while. And the, the reason for that is because I really want this to have a kind of like a more uh, flinty almost mouthfeel. Uh, it, I want some minerality in the character of the beer. Traditionally, English, Irish, and Scottish brewing water has never really been particularly soft. Uh, so we're gonna try and emulate that a little bit today. Uh, nothing too overboard, we're not doing Verton on Trent water, but we are doing uh, a little bit heavier water profile than usual. So uh, I'm targeting a profile of 77 parts per million of calcium, 16 parts per million of magnesium, 36 parts per million of sodium, 95 parts per million of chloride, 119 parts per million of sulfate and 94 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of spring water, which may have some residual bicarbonate and other minerals in it, uh, which really can only help this. So to that eight gallons of spring water, I'm adding in three grams of gypsum, five grams of Epsom, six grams of calcium chloride, and four grams of sodium bicarbonate. For the yeast strain, I'm using Imperial Darkness, which is Irish Ale. Um, you can get the same exact yeast strain in many other forms from many other manufacturers, but I have really fallen in love with the Imperial version of it, specifically that pitch rate just is awesome. So I'm aiming to get this beer fermented really, really fast. I'm hoping with a higher pitch rate from the Imperial yeast, I'm also making a starter on top of this, uh, that this low gravity beer can get knocked out, fermented in about a week, and have very, very little ester uh, in it. For the mash in this beer, I'm gonna be mashing this one uh, at about 152 Fahrenheit. Uh, so that way we get ourselves down to a relatively standard final gravity, somewhere between like 1010 and 1012, I hope. Um, maybe a little bit lower than 1010, depending on what wants to happen here. There should be a characteristic dryness in the finish of this beer, uh, but keep in mind that this recipe has added some ingredients that are going to accentuate that dryness. The slightly higher sulfate to chloride ratio is gonna make the beer feel a bit drier, as well as adding in that tiny amount of roasted barley. That actually does bring out a little dryness. Um, so if we mash too low, we could end up with a situation where it's overly dry for the style. I don't wanna do that. I'm thinking I wanna balance that a little bit with the mash temperature, leave a little bit of residual sweetness there. The crystal malt's gonna help out with that as well, so we gotta keep that in mind. There's a lot of things to balance here when it comes to specifically how the beer finishes in the palate, but I'm hoping it all works out well. Anyway, I'm all ready to brew, so let's go ahead and head downstairs and get this thing started. So I started out by adding eight gallons of strike water to my claw hammer supply 10 gallon 240 volt system and started to heat it up to the mash temperature of 152. As the temperature was increasing and as the water was heating up, I measured out all of my water salts, which there were quite a few in this one, and I added them into the heating up water to dissolve. I also measured out and milled all of my grain with the exception of the roasted barley. The roasted barley I separately milled about a quarter pound of and kept off to the side. Once the water had reached the mash in temperature of 152 Fahrenheit, I went ahead and doughed in with the entire grist with the exception of the roasted barley. I let the mash sit and recirculate for about 10 minutes before measuring the pH, and it came out to a pretty solid 5.36, which uh, is on target for this beer style. So I left it alone, didn't add any lactic acid or anything like that. I let the mash sit for about 30 minutes, and then with 30 minutes left in the mash, I started to gradually add in roasted barley, only about one ounce at a time, letting it recirculate and letting it pick up that color until I was satisfied with the red color of the wort. Turns out it was about three ounces of roasted barley that needed to go in to get the desired color out of this. 
Once the mash had rested for a total of one hour, I raised it up to a mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit and let it rest there for 15 minutes before pulling out the grain basket entirely and then letting it drain for 15 more minutes. As this was going on though, I raised it up to a temperature just below boiling to ensure we didn't have a boil over but to still get a head start on things. Once I reached the boil, I added in my bittering addition of one ounce of East Kent Goldings and then let the boil continue for another 30 minutes before adding in my half ounce flavor edition of East Kent Goldings at 30 minutes. 20 minutes later at the 10 minute mark, I added in one Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient in order to help facilitate the fermentation. And once the boil had completed after an hour, I went ahead and began a whirlpool process, which uh, helps coagulate all that troub and hop debris and stuff in the center of the kettle to allow for clear wort to go into the fermenter. I accomplished this by turning on the pump for about three minutes and then letting the whirlpool rest for 15 minutes and everything was piled up into a nice neat cone at the end of that process. I ran it through my accelerator counterflow chiller and was able to do a single pass chill to get us down to a pitching temperature of 65 Fahrenheit. Before pitching the yeast, I measured the OG of the wort and found it to be 1052, which was actually four points higher than my anticipated OG, uh, which kind of bumps the ABV on this one a little higher than it should be, but I think it'll still be okay. Once I had collected all the wort in my anvil bucket fermenter, I went ahead and I pitched my entire yeast starter of Imperial Darkness and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, it's very important that we pick a yeast from the appropriate region. Um, that is ideally an Irish ale yeast, so that's going to be either Imperial Darkness, like I'm using here today, WLP004, Yeast1084, or Omega OIL005. Um, there is no dry Irish ale yeast that I know of. However, you can substitute for it with a relatively dry fermenting English ale strain like Nottingham. They'll do a pretty good job here. If you want to, you can use an English ale yeast or a Scottish ale yeast. They're going to do similar things. At that point, though, you're kind of starting to drift away from the style of Irish red and you're turning it more into just a regular old uh, pub style bitter. So um, if that's what you want to make, more power to you. But one type of yeast that is traditional in Irish red ale brewing, especially in the modern age, is actually lager yeast. Um, that's right, Irish red ale, specifically some of the more exported versions of it, uh, is actually brewed most frequently with a lager yeast. So if you want to stick with dry yeast, Saf Lager W3470, Diamond Lager, um, but really any other kind of international type of lager yeast is going to do the trick for you um, if you want to stick with that. It, it will require a little bit more attention to the fermentation. You may not want to ferment it super warm to keep those esters under control because remember, this is not supposed to be an estery beer. So that guidance applies across every single yeast strain you choose. In reality, because this is home brewing, you can use whatever yeast you want. Um, the world is your oyster. I would, however, definitely recommend that you pick a clean fermenting ale yeast for this beer. Regardless, just to focus us and recap, I'm going to be using Irish ale yeast, which is Imperial Darkness. I'm going to be using a relatively high pitch rate uh, for the gravity of the beer because I want to get it done fast and without esters. Um, and I really, honestly, the reason is the Super Bowl's in like a week and I want to get it on tap for the Super Bowl. You don't necessarily need to use the same pitch rate that I'm using, but that will not only accelerate the brewing process, but it will also really cut down on the yeast expression and the esters involved. Uh, Irish ale yeast is going to throw a small berry ester depending on uh, your pitch rate, um, which can be a compliment to the style, but I really don't want to have too much ester activity in here, but still remain authentic. So that's why I'm using that. More importantly though, an English, Scottish, or Irish yeast is going to have a residual mouthfeel effect on the beer, uh, and the yeast itself is actually going to give it a little bit rounder of a mouthfeel. It's going to have a very specific profile to the finished beer that is unique to ales from that region of the world. 
and that's why I'm sticking with that traditional ingredient. So there's more to it than just being authentic. Anyway, the most important thing here, I'm gonna go ahead and ferment this at 65 Fahrenheit, uh, which is a little bit of a cooler temperature. It's definitely the right temperature for an ester-free English, Irish, or Scottish ale. So you wanna make sure that uh, if you want more yeast expression, bring it up to 68, perhaps. But you're gonna get fruity esters. You're gonna get strong berry notes if you do that. So we're sticking with 65 Fahrenheit. It'll probably take about a week to ferment this beer. Uh, maybe a little bit longer. Basically though, once the primary fermentation is complete, I'm gonna go ahead and keg it, maybe leave it at room temperature for another couple days, and then we'll go ahead and put it on tap. I really don't think I'm gonna need any sort of cold side findings to clarify this one either, because of two things. Number one, uh, English, Scottish, and Irish yeast really do love to flocculate out of the beer really quickly after their finished fermentation but also the significant amount of calcium I'm throwing into the brewing water is gonna help encourage that even more. Um, so it should really drop out clean and clear naturally uh, really, really fast, which will be nice. But if that doesn't happen, uh, we'll go ahead and throw a little bit of gelatin in there, make sure that that actually does happen. Uh, it should be a clear beer. It's very important for the presentation of it, and it really helps that red color shine. So hopefully the fermentation goes well, and I will see you guys in about a week. So until then, Cheers. So the fermentation for this beer went really quite well overall. Despite my ambitions of wanting to get this done within seven days, it actually took more like 10 days to get completely finished, but it was still able to be served for the Super Bowl party that we had. So uh, with the help of gelatin, I was able to clear that up within 24 hours of putting it on tap and carbonating and uh, people enjoyed it quite a bit at the Super Bowl party, thankfully, so that was a success. Overall, the beer turned out quite nice for the style, even though the uh, final gravity may have been a bit high, it actually was a very balanced pint, and uh, I'm excited to tell you more about it here in a few minutes. So the beer is called Captain Crack Sparrow, and it comes in at 5.1% ABV and about 25 IBUs. The color of the beer is an absolutely stunning red color. Uh, this is exactly what I was envisioning in my mind color-wise. It is perfectly clear. It has this really nice off-white cream-colored head, and the head sticks around for a long time. It has very good structure, very good lacing, leaves a layer on the surface, and all that I am hoping for in the head of a beer is in this particular pint. So overall, I'm really pleased with the appearance of the beer and that deep red color that is present is exactly the right shade. It's not copper, it's not orange, it's not brown. It is just sheer scarlet red. So now let's go in for aroma. Right off the bat, the aroma on this beer is a really nice, very satisfying, uh, kind of toffee-like uh, toastiness. Uh, there's a, a little bit of a hint of sweetness in the aroma, a little bit of nuttiness. There's a good amount of overall general maltiness in the aroma that's uh, quite satisfying. All right, so now let's go in for a mouthfeel. Mmm. The mouthfeel on this one is definitely light. It's um, rounded. It's got a good character to it. It really lets the malt flavor shine without being full bodied or feeling like it's a heavy drink. Um, it definitely doesn't feel like it has a lot of alcohol in it. Uh, but the overall character of the mouthfeel is smooth, round, and light bodied. Um, very mild overall, and it suits it well. There is a certain uh, minerality to it as well that uh, definitely came through in that water profile addition that I made, and it worked really, really well. So for the carbonation level on this one, as a traditional kind of normally served from a cask type ale, uh, this is something that you want to really keep the carbonation level lower on. Um, I did not necessarily do that. Um, this is carbonated to a relatively standard level of about two to two and a half volumes of CO2, um, which 
definitely gives it a different character, a more Americanized character, I suppose, than something you would get across the pond, but it overall has a decent level of carbonation. It's not too much, um, and it works in this style, but if you want to be more authentic to it, you probably do want to carbonate this to a lower degree, something around like 1.8 volumes of CO2 would be best. Having said, it doesn't really affect the mouthfeel too much, so I wouldn't say it's too big of a deal. So now let's go in for flavor, because this is actually a very flavorful beer. Mmm. To date, I would say this is actually the best Irish Red that I've made, and definitely the best one on the channel. Um, it beats out the one I made a couple years ago by, by a long shot, because this has a lot more residual flavor to it, and it feels light. Uh, so, if I remember correctly, the one I did several years ago had a ton of flavor as well, but it was a bit of fuller, it was a bit fuller feeling of a beer, though. And this one really nails that light-bodied, easy-drinking characteristic that you should have with these beers. So right up front, that mild malt comes through with a really, really nice residual base sweetness to it. it it's very similar to Maris Otter in a way, but without being full and, and bready like that. It's, it's actually a light toasted toffee character. And there's a nice, crisp graininess to it uh, as well that comes through, and it, uh, it provides a really nice base. We also get a good amount of caramel toffee character. Um, this is not caramel sweetness, it's toffee-like. Um, it's a slightly darker kind of flavor, um, and it has a different characteristic, but it works very well in this beer. It doesn't taste sweet necessarily, and most of that is also due to the roasted barley we added in, but um, it has a pleasantly uh, rounding caramel character to it, toffee character, I guess, um, that is really on point for this style. There's a really nice residual toasted bread character as well uh, that comes on the back half. And then of course there is the roasted barley malt addition that goes into this. That does round the whole thing off and make it a true Irish red. The roasted barley has a flavor contribution and as I said at the beginning, it does actually dry this out a little bit. There is the slightest little hint of roasted malt character uh, kind of in the middle of the palate when you take a sip of this. Uh, it's, it's definitely there enough to give a little bit of a flavor, uh, a contribution, but it doesn't distract, it doesn't take away, um, and it certainly isn't unwelcome either in the overall flavor character of the beer. It actually fits really, really well and makes this taste like a real Irish red. It's kind of like a Smithix with extra flavor, and I'm really quite happy about that. The yeast character on this is very clean. There is that little bit of a mouthfeel contribution that I discussed earlier in the video. And there is a very slight, very, very, very slight uh, berry note to it that actually rounds the whole thing off. There's also a very nice earthy hop layer underneath all of this that blends in nicely uh, with the rest of it. So it works out well. So overall, it's a real easy drinking pint. It's a really satisfying one as well. Loads of flavor, loads of complexity to it without feeling necessarily like it's a big, heavy, complex, strong beer. It's not. The alcohol is like ever so slightly a little high for the style, um, but for most of us home brewers here, you know, plus or minus 0.5% ABV isn't really a big deal. But it's a nice character, it's a balanced pint, and it works really well. This whole thing actually worked out pretty much exactly as I had envisioned it would, um, which is really nice. It's really satisfying when you can make a beer that uh, is exactly what you had pictured in your head. Um, and that's a very nice feeling. So overall, for potential improvements, I don't think there's really too much here to discuss other than potentially bringing down the OG a little bit to make it more two style, I suppose. But that's it. There's really not all that much to think about. Otherwise, all the flavors work really well together. Uh, they blend nicely, they complement each other, and they're not necessarily there in excess in any way whatsoever. The only thing I think that maybe could be a little bit off-putting to some folks, perhaps, would be that roasted barley note. Um, I really like it, but I'm not exactly sure how everyone else might interpret that, and that's one of those flavors that is muted in your classic big brewery productions of Irish Reds. It tends to not really show up as much, but this being a more true to the authentic original style uh, of an Irish Red kind of makes that happen a little bit more, and I like that. So it's kind of a, that's a personal preference thing. It could be up to you if you want to maybe dial that back a bit then feel free to do so. But that's really all I have for this one. It's, it's a great beer. It's certainly something that I would brew again and again. So overall, great success.
So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're making an Irish red for St. Patrick's Day this year, let me know down in the comments, and let me know if this was helpful in designing that recipe or getting it ready in time for that time of year. If you enjoyed the video and if you learned something, please go ahead, hit the like button, hit that subscribe button as well if you haven't already, and comment down below. If you want to help support the channel, I have a number of ways to do that. Uh, the best way, I think, is to get a t-shirt or a hoodie or something like that from my merchandise store which you can find down in the description box or just down below it that way you get something out of the deal but there's also other ways to help support me if you want to i also have a patreon which is a huge help in terms of helping upgrade the production quality of this channel i also have channel memberships and there's the super thanks option as well if you want to check any of those out i do greatly appreciate all of those options I also have an Amazon store where you can find a lot of the equipment that I use to brew with and to film with and all that good stuff. So check that out in the description box if you're curious. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Facebook and Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. So check that stuff out for some more frequent content updates than just YouTube. And lastly, but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. I put a ton of work and a lot of effort into these videos, so it does uh, mean a lot when people are sticking around all the way to the end. So if you're still here, I really appreciate that. So until the next one, Sasha.